I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker today, Professor Janet Ward. Uh, there's always with uh, uh, a friend, so I can say Janet. With Janet, there's always a question of, do you want to read her whole CV, or do you want to actually listen to her speak? Uh, I would always rather listen to her speak, so I won't read her whole CV. I'll just read the blurb from her most recent work with Gabriel Rosenfeld, Fascism in America, Past and Present, and I'm just going to read it. Uh, Janet Ward is an American Council on Education Fellow at Yale University and Brammer Presidential Professor of History and Faculty Fellow for Strategic Initiatives at the University of Oklahoma. A past president of the German Studies Association, she is the author or co-editor of seven books, including Post-Wall Berlin, Border Space and Identity, and the forthcoming Sites of Holocaust Memory. Uh, and believe me, even without looking at her CV, I could add a whole lot more but I will say we're so glad that Janet could be here. Uh, and so without further ado, Professor Janet Ward. Thank you so much for your interest in today's topic. The title of my paper is The New Public History of Eugenics. One way, sadly but tellingly, to recognize the state of our eugenics legacy is to look for human bones, the bones on display, the bones hidden underground, the body parts left neglected in the basement. Here, the Musée de l'Homme, the Museum of Mankind at the Trocadero in Paris, opposite the Eiffel Tower, has over 18,000 skeletons and skulls and won't say whose they are. Algerian anthropologists recently counted over 500 of these skulls as belonging to 19th century Algerian resistance fighters, and the Algerians have asked for them back. Here on the left, you see uh, something from the Middle Ages from Peru. It's quite shocking when you go there with American expectations of bones and skeletons not being on display to see still Europe still has a way to go with that sort of recognition. I was there in October and saw that. The Smithsonian, with its Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., meanwhile, has 30,700 human bones and body parts removed from mostly non-white people from over 80 countries, either without consent or looted. This year, the Washington Post conducted the most extensive study to date of these hidden holdings. Even after the federal law, uh, 1989, uh, except for the Smithsonian, which delayed following suit until 2012, that requires that Native American, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian communities now have to be informed so that their uh, ethical return of remains uh, can occur. That still leaves the museum with many thousands of unknown human remains. The Smithsonian's racial brain collection, as it was called, was built by the leading eugenicist, Alice Herdica, member of the Yale-founded American uh, Eugenics Society until Herdica's death in 1943. Most families did not and still do not know that body parts of their deceased relatives were even taken. Uh, here on the um, left, you can see, really look, um, um, a photograph of Herdlicker, and on the right, you can see where they're kept, which is um, a storage facility opposite a mall um, at the Smithsonian's Museum Support Center in Sweetland, Maryland. For now, the Smithsonian has called a halt to research on any of their human remains, and the director of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, has issued a statement about the great need for transparency and an end to this silence. The predicament of the Musée de l'Homme and of the Smithsonian are not isolated ones. The Samuel George Morton Cranial Collection at the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology has one of the largest skull collections in the world. You see it here on the left, for example, including the skulls of African Americans and indigenous peoples. Likewise, Harvard's Peabody Museum, 
has over 7,000 bodies of Native Americans and African American slaves. Uh, you see the scene from Harvard's Peabody's uh, classroom, uh, probably the 1950s, early 60s. Yale's own Peabody Museum has been under conveniently timed renovation. And as Yale's president, Peter Salovey, has said to me, what is going back in for its 2024 reopening is not what went out of it. These predicaments are not only about the need to decolonize the Universal Museum, the collections of which were literally built upon and with the bodies of empire. It is also an extension of what made the Holocaust possible. Medical doctors in the post-war Germanys and Austria, until brave journalists like Gertz Elli, who himself has a disabled child, fought to bring this to the public's attention over the last 20, 30 years or so, were trained using human remains in research collections from the atrocities of the Third Reich, including the brains of euthanized children. On the left, you see uh, Spiegelgrunt's uh, commemorative um, stele in Vienna, dedicated to the children whose brains were used in research after their euthanasia uh, in Vienna. Hans Asperger delivered poorly performing autistic children to the euthanasia program if they didn't qualify for his own interpretation of higher performing autistic lives deemed, quote, worthy, according to Nazi terminology, of contributing to the Nazi community, the Volksgemeinschaft. And this is something which perhaps you haven't heard of. If you have, it's probably through the work of Edith Scheffler at Berkeley, who helped bring this to light about Hans Asperger. And doctors all over the world still insist on referring to what you see on the right, the Nazi-era anatomy atlas by Eduard Penkopf, who based his drawings on dissected concentration camp victims. And here I'd like to mention that we have Rona Seidelman in the audience, whose father, Dr. Seidelman, has worked tirelessly throughout his career to bring this connection to light and to help end uh, the reliance of the medical profession on the Penkoff Atlas. So thank you, Rona, for that webinar that you did with your father during the pandemic. I always appreciate that. The human remains issue became entirely literal for me when I saw pre-pandemic what appeared to be a child's forearm bone on the sandy soil as I stepped off the path in the forest clearing at Sobibor. It was jutting out semi-exposed, one side white and one side dark above the soil. The rainstorms had been extensive across Poland in the preceding days and had washed away much of the topsoil. The most recent series of forensic archaeological investigations in the open area of mass graves surrounding the aging mausoleum from 1965 at Sonibor had already been intentionally removed uh, and had taken away the grass and topsoil from the dig sites uh, dotted around the field by the archaeologists. But where I was standing was not at one of the areas worked on by the archaeologists. It still had grass cover. I looked down to see more closely and was shocked to see that the half unburied bone was surrounded by an infinite number of smaller shards of bones and bricks. As I walked on, I saw how the bone shards extended all around me, sticking up in the sand at Sobibor, across the forest clearing area, neglected and all around. The dead of the mass graves then were not wholly below ground. The bones dark sides, offered indications of long-term partial exposure to the elements. These Sobibor bones were sticking up, protruding, insisting on their victim's presence after decades of neglect near the Polish-Ukrainian and Polish-Belarus borders. They rose up over the ground surface during all these decades. In fact, whenever the weather conditions dictated, what I saw was not atypical. The impact of the extremely heavy rainfall had simply revealed more plainly what was already known that Sobibor was still a site of massacre, plain and simple. Despite its small collection of monuments, it was pre-pandemic unfinished to the point of not truly being able to serve as a memory site. It was not yet hygienically ready, so to speak, to be part of the stage of Holocaust commemoration that was with equal energy since the 1990s, especially in the United States, 
both praised as a universal ethical memory trope and criticized as the Holocaust industry. Seven decades after this particular death camp had ceased operations due to the prisoners' revolt of October 1943, I was standing in the killing field with the remains of over 200,000 of Europe's Jews. For an event or a site to reach what Daniel Levy and Nathan Snyder have termed the universal trope of human rights that rep is represented by the Holocaust, one is first obliged to cover the bone. This is a basic humanitarian duty and is required by rabbinic law for that matter. Since that summer of 2018, when I visited Sobibor, its terrain of bones has now been sanitized using crushed white marble. Here on the right, you see uh, well, Google Maps vision of this uh, protective lid. The scene of visible mass death then has received its protective lid of white, white marble covering the entire forest clearing in the same way, more or less, as you can find at Treblinka and Belgette, but far whiter. A new museum building and exhibit were inaugurated at Sobibor in 2020, and the museum website proclaims, with rather obvious relief, that, quote, the securing, the covering, and the proper protection of the site, and hence of the dead, can be hopefully concluded and achieved for the visiting public. So my shock steps of Sobibor before the mass graves lid had been put in place to cover them up became, in a way, a personal prompt for me. Sobibor's belated transformation from a neglected and abysmal killing field to a respectably moving, if still borderland and remote site of Holocaust memory, where curated exhibits of artifacts are still being found by forensic archaeologists, rather than uncurated victims' bones, will still teach tourists about the genocide that occurred there. They can usefully demonstrate the urgency of our needing to nonetheless understand what is still beneath that landscaped lid. So what happened at these sites and their related artifacts still being brought to light can never really be smoothed over with any lid. All of these then, the museum and the archival collections of human remains and the mass graves of genocide alike constitute an overwhelming body of evidence of unwilling primary sources. And these unwilling primary sources demand an involved energy and reciprocity from us. Next April, I'm helping put together a Holocaust symposium that can help shine a light on these unwilling primary sources of eugenics that our society continues to neglect. It will be led by Yale University's program on biomedical ethics, April 24, tune in live, and it will focus on past and present legal and medical eugenics and their connection to the Holocaust. My personal engagement with this topic in cultural, scientific, and medical memory originates with the work I did as co-editor of the Fascism in America volume, thank you, Anne, for mentioning that, that appeared this September with Cambridge University Press. But more to the point, my inspiration started with the lessons I learned from my fellow authors for the volume. They've taught me much about bringing research and engagement commitments far more closely in line with each other. As a direct result then, of the experience of bringing the Fascism in America volume to publication this fall, I'm now turning to the project I'm calling A New Public History of Eugenics. It's well known, at least to historians, that eugenics-based policies in the United States that targeted immigration, civil rights, birth control, and education while ostensibly claiming social reform goals resulted in fact in heavy abuses <clears throat> toward the poor, toward non-whites, toward refugees, women, children, and the disabled. But this is still resisted in terms of public acknowledgement. Most of us don't ever really want to see ourselves in anything other than the Allies' good war narrative of World War II. Most people don't want to see the connection between this country's eugenicist mindset and, for example, the 1924 Immigration Act that then set the stage for the Nuremberg Race Laws of 1935. And for this country's refusal 
of European Jewish refugees in the 1930s and 40s. But the eugenicists at that time certainly saw and wrote about these connections. Significantly, we often can't or won't see the urgency of understanding past eugenics within our own societies to better deal with its reemergence for the present, our present. This is why the lessons from the Holocaust and other genocides were not really truly learned. And I think that helps explain why Holocaust memory is crumbling today. Our world is witnessing a sharp rise in anti-Semitic uh, uh, and anti-immigrant ret rhetoric, racially motivated hate crimes, white supremacy, anti-immigration uh, uh, proponents, ableism, gender bias, and anti-LGBTQ plus laws. Currently, for example, our own state, Oklahoma, has filed over 35 anti-LGBTQ plus laws, next only nationwide to Texas, but far outranking the number in Florida. Since the Hamas terrorist attack on civilian Israelis on October the 7th of this year, there's been a 300% rise in anti-Semitic violence in this country and in France, and a rise of 537% in my own home country, the UK. So my project on the new public history of eugenics is based on the recognition that there's a growing need for an activist approach in the intersections of transnational public history and biomedical ethics. The logic of the approach is to make past traces and present legacies of institutional and archival eugenics much more visible to and much more accessible for a wide range of impacted communities. For as the multitude of bones and human remains suggest, eugenics is far from simply dead and buried. Moreover, plenty of corporations have a very vested interest in totally denying any connection of medical technology to the history and future of eugenics. How is this call for activism best responded to? Well, I'd suggest it's first absolutely vital to simply state what happened, when and how. And that's where public history comes in. One institution linked to propagating eugenics in the United States is the American Natural History Museum in New York City which in 2021, and you can see on the right, issued a direct apology for its role. And this museum in New York has also just admitted uh, on the 16th of October of this year, that they still have over 12,000 human remains and have finally cottoned on. So they should in fact stop displaying those bones and conducting research involving them. The dominant theme of the 1921 International Conference on Eugenics was held at the American Natural History Museum in New York City. Its focus, and here's the key, was on eugenics opposite term, dysgenics. The conference program's obsession with dysgenics, the badly born, as opposed to eugenics of sensible focus on the well-born, points to what was really at stake for this country at the height of the popularity of eugenics as a social reform movement, and as the United States rose to become the internationally recognized leader in eugenics-based attempts at human engineering. Focusing on the well-born meant, above all, preventing the degeneration and influence and impact of the badly born, the transmission of undesirable genetic or racial or sexual traits. And so the step toward not letting in or expelling or sterilizing or ultimately eliminating those who would transmit these undesirable genetic, including racial and sexual traits, inevitably became the focus of medical and legal policy, hence dysgenics. In National Socialism, as we know, it became the determining unifying trait for the party platform. This genic then is an unfortunate but accurate history about our country here. It's a tale of attempted control and it underpins so many belief systems that still hold sway right here, right now. How we distinguish intelligence from developmentally challenged, 
how we distinguish normal from abnormal sexuality, conformist from deviant behavior, how we citizens, or how we separate, sorry, citizens from aliens, or how we separate accepted immigrants from unwanted refugees. The list goes on. And here's a key question for our consideration. Where and how is today's medical profession examining its tainted institutional legacies of eugenics? After all, the word eugenics was disgraced in the United States in the 1940s once the Nazi atrocities became known. But much of the eugenicists' work simply became transferred to new terminology like genetics. And involuntary or forced sterilizations continued apace in this country until after the Second World War, totaling about 70,000 in all between 1907 and 1963. Rather than simply universalizing the murderous tendencies exhibited by far too many, say, of Stanley Milgram's infinite, infamous test participants in 1961, we should be re-examining how we became that kind of right, wrong, pass, fail, in, out, society in the first place that simply accepted the authority of the men in the white coats, even if it means electrocuting someone, like in the Milgram test, who gets a test answer wrong. Um, on the left, you could see them all standing there for the 1921 conference program. Um, they uh, had several forms of emphasis in their papers that were totally dysgenic. One of them included a massive uh, um, section on um, the skulls uh, from the Smithsonian's collection, um, for example, and another had a, a separate section on Madison Grant's book, which I'll get to in a minute, from 1916. In terms of how contemporary self-assessment work is going then, I'm also interested in the National Human Genome Project's Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Research Program. In other words, there are efforts but how are they actually really doing in terms of self-assessment and who are they reaching? I'm equally interested in learning of similar efforts of institutional self-assessment as for example, Oxford University, where a leading professor of practical ethics called Julian Savalescu, who you see here, has coined the term procreative beneficence that has since become accepted at increasingly dangerous face value. Why? Because there are enormous profits to be made in an increasingly uncontrolled world of genetic testing, and now also gene editing technology known as CRISPR-Cas9. This same field of contemporary medicine claims it still can't really replace anything that does anything better than the Hancock Atlas, which is astonishing as a claim in today's era. And if you really want to be scared, you should read up about Savalescu's procreative beneficence in his eponymous article subtitled, Why We Should Select the Best Children. Sadly, I'm not kidding, pun intended. It's already happening. For example, Savalescu at Oxford writes in praise of how polygenic risk, risk scores sorry, have been introduced into IVF to eliminate embryos, say, with the diabetes gene. Disability rights scholars are urgently pointing out that Savalescu's advocacy is essentially eugenics masquerading as ethics. Savalescu openly advocates, say, for drug-enhanced sports achievement, the achievement of the Lenny Riefenstahl's perfect body. He's even called for, quote, morally requiring, end quote, genetic testing in order to eliminate criminal potential. Gene editing, which you may know, uh, is fast approaching actual applications in non-democracy. It doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination for us to imagine that institutionalized populations, such as prison inmates in non-democracies, will swiftly and quickly be modified in situ once gene editing technology permits it, and we're not that far off. In short, Savalescu is openly reestablishing the practice of eugenicist approach, approaches as an actual ethics. When criticized, Savalescu blames his interlocutor or his critic as the ultimate quote Nazi, attempting to hamper the freedom 
of medical innovation. For example, Savalot who said, quote, what I think we're trying to do by restricting people's freedom is much closer to a state-sponsored eugenic vision or a state-sponsored vision about the way the world should be that restricts procreative freedom for the sake of achieving some sort of social goal. He turns around the lens of uh, control back on his critic. But Savalevsky's arguments in favor of eliminating chronic conditions through the pre-selection of embryos and now through gene editing of existing populations, potentially and soon, is in fact negative dysgenics. So the reason why we need to admit to our, our eugenic legacy is because they're both our present and past, our past and our future. Ever since the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as books like this one by Yale legal historian Jim Whitman in his 2017 landmark study, Hitler's American Model, organizations and institutions are starting gradually to own up to the ways in which American eugenics has been hiding in plain sight all along. And not just in the laws of the Jim Crow South, but in the American Northeast that thought itself anti racist uh, since the Civil War and the American West as well. Med schools, philanthropic and educational organizations, as well as universities, archives, and museums, in a deeply transnational sense, all bear a responsibility to acknowledge their role in legitimizing eugenics-based standards, not just in medicine, but in education, immigration, zoology, veterinary medicine, of course, anthropology, environmental studies, psychiatry, biology, and statistics, and so on. What are we not admitting right here in Norman, for example, right here, about the relationship between eugenics policy and practice? How many of us in this room know that by the 1950s, the population of this city's Central State Hospital, AKA the insane asylum as it was known, exceeded the number of students at the University of Oklahoma? Norman's own history of eugenics has also been hiding in plain sight. In 1946, journalist for the Oklahoman Mike Gorman came back from World War II and decided to stay working in Oklahoma. And he advocated in face of this state's appalling conditions for institutionalizing the mentally ill and socially deviant. And here you can see uh, two photographs of women in the, what was known as the violent insane ward uh, in the rather non aptly named Pope Paul uh, at the um, uh, hospital site, which of course is where Griffin Memorial Hospital is today. Here I'd like to praise the work of OU colleague Scott Hammerstead, who, as state forensic archaeologist, helped identify the location of 40 of this asylum's patients who'd perished in a fire in 1918 and simply been thrown into an unmarked mass grave. Um, thank goodness. There is now a marker uh, for these uh, people who, who died, and that was a frequent occurrence of these kinds of asylum locations, uh, uncontrolled fires. Now, in fact, that this urban memory is starting to be recognized about the asylum, this fall, a decision, maybe a political one, has been made to shut down Griffin Memorial Hospital because it will function better, they say, um, by moving to Oklahoma City and becoming linked to OSD. Elsewhere in the West, recognition is growing. At the end of 2020, Caltech issued its internal self-assessment by the Committee on Naming and Recognition to deal with the Human Betterment Foundation's legacies on the campus. In fall 2022, the Huntington Library in San Marino next door uh, to um, um, uh, Caltech in a way, hosted a eugenics conference, quote, called Centering Race and Disability in History, Histories of Eugenics, about California's key role in the American eugenics movement. In the 1920s, several members of the Huntington Library Board served on another board, that of the Human Betterment Foundation based in next door Pasadena. The Human Betterment Foundation even hosted a Nazi scientific exhibit at the um, American Public Health Association uh, conference in Pasadena. And here you see people admiring this particular uh, 
exhibit called Eugenics in the New Germany with materials directly imported from a recent Nazi exhibit at Dresden's Hygiene Museum, which is essentially Germany's leading museum of, of uh, that time for racial hygiene. The exhibit then toured California and Oregon and landed up in the Heredity Hall, get the name, in the Museum of Science in Buffalo, New York, where it stayed until eventually being taken down in 1943. Yes, it took the United States from 1934 to 1943 to destroy this exhibit that went all over the place. Astonishing. So some important internal investigations are still ongoing. For example, there's one with the text you can see down there. Um, I'm happy to share the slides afterwards so you can see what it says. This is the Rockefeller Foundation admitting its influence by eugenics funding of the, uh, along with the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, certainly not alone in this, of, say, the eugenics record office in Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island in New York, of a vast array of international eugenics courses and individuals. This is our Rockefeller Foundation admitting finally to having done this. And it even supported the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, Human Heredity, and Eugenics in Berlin, Darlin. Uh, it's essentially uh, responsible for keeping that institute afloat with generous grants of up to $25,000 a year, plus many other kinds of funding at that time during the Depression years from 1930 to 1934. An important indicator of this shift then is the new anti eugenics collective at Yale people I got to know last year and admire very much. They're looking at, other, among other things, at Yale itself as a major site of eugenic organizing and research. Scholars and community leaders are investigating the history of slavery at Yale. David Blight's new book is due out in February and it will focus very much on that. And it has many, many, many institutions and institutes at Yale that have a direct link to government policy over the years. I mentioned the American Eugenics Society founded by Yaleys, there's also the Yale Study Center, the Yale Institute of Psychology, the Yale Institute of Human Relations, and so on and so forth. All of this then points to the fact that Yale's relationship, like Harvard's, but it might, it's been so far of knowing uh, what's going on, their research is so closely related to the formation of intelligence testing for immigrants and influencing, in fact, the chair of the committee behind the 1924 Immigration Restriction Act uh, was a Yale professor, hell-bent on legitimizing eugenics-based uh, psychology and therefore motivated to put into policy what he wanted to enact for his field. Yale, in other words, has a lot to atone for. On the right, you see the program excerpt from 1921, and on the left, you see some artwork by uh, a Yale student putting this into uh, the Yale Anti-Eugenics Collective Initiative currently ongoing. I recommend their website. Just type in anti eugenics initiative at Yale, you'll get a lot of info. Another good example of a university understanding what it needs to do is the Entgrenzte Anatomie. So, Anatomy Without Borders or Boundaries exhibit that opened earlier this year at the Anatomical Institute of the University of Tübingen. Its goal is to reveal how the use of corpses for medical training at this German university skyrocketed the moment the Third Reich was able to procure as many bodies as it wished from execution, literally taking place right next door to the Anatomical Institute. When I was there this spring, it was quite shocking to see that they really just took the bodies that were executed on a trolley and wheeled them straight into the Anatomical Institute next door. And the university continued to use these corpses after the war. And that was a frequent occurrence, of course. On the left here, you simply see a poor young guy who uh, was executed for having stolen some leather items for food. So it wasn't even someone who you think would be necessarily uh, um, destined for execution. They just were out to collect uh, uh, evidence and, and corpses as quickly as possible to basically dissuade anyone from becoming remotely socially deviant in any way. What are some steps to take then, in addition to the institutions re-examining themselves in the evidence-based light of these eugenicist legacies? In my research project, I also hope to showcase the work of those who dared to swim upstream 
For example, the efforts of anti-eugenics activists. They can teach us a lot by their example, both by their successes as well as by their failings. Franz Boas, for example, occupied a lonely spot among American anthropologists by practicing active anti-eugenics uh, 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 endeavors in his overt opposition to eugenics-based science in the United States. And anti-eugenics activism was also carried out by individuals, groups, and organizations seeking to help immigrants, refugees fleeing Nazi Europe, as well as the disabled women and children. And there's a long list of sources I'm now consulting. The impact of refugee activist Cecilia Radovsky, for example, the National Refugee Service, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, as you see here, the National Council of Jewish Women, the Non-Sectarian Committee for German Refugee Children, case testimony briefs on deportation, the Commission on Law and Social Action of the American Jewish Congress, the National Coordinating Committee for Aid to Refugees and Immigrants Coming from Germany, the Jewish German Children's Aid, and the National Jewish Welfare Board, to name a few. So in addition to looking at these individuals and organizations' heroism, I'm also realizing that there were some gray areas, to be sure. Refugee organizations, in attempts to get children into this country out of Nazi Europe, tried engaging the very same psychometric eugenic standards on their own merits by trying to select the best children that would fit what the United States had as its, quote, manual of the mental examination of aliens, end quote. There's also the history of Jewish eugenics, for example, against intermarriage. Some Jewish psychiatrists have their own racial beliefs, and even with the rise of Nazism, continued in them. And there's a strong dose of eugenics in Zionism, too. And there is such a thing as the rise of Jewish race science by the work of Wilhelm or William Nussbaum. In other instances, such an approach has nonetheless garnered useful community outreach for identifying post-Holocaust Jewish roots. I'm thinking, for example, of the Center for Jewish History DNA Reunion Project at the Achman and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute, among others. My research goal, then, is simply to do a deep dive into a wide transnational range of eugenic source material across the discipline. But my public history goal remains the primary reason for the research dive, to help bring the topic more to the fore, so that people outside of history and bioethics, and Jewish studies, people beyond the room today can better understand the eugenics-based roots of so many of our assumptions that remain unquestioned, that remain unanswered, and are more necessary than ever for us to get a handle on, given new medical technological development. This kind of public-facing work, I believe, is important in an era in which silence or reticence by an institution about the bones in its basement or by a town or village or city about the need for a commemoration of a race massacre as a memory site, and here I'm thinking of Tulsa as much as anywhere else, can and will be equated by the extreme right as more than a tacit acceptance or acquiescence. That's the era, that's the urgency, that's where we are right now. The Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory, Grand Bon Placement, Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory, favored by today's white supremacists, is a fabrication entirely built upon the eugenic race-based paranoia established 100 years ago by Madison Grant. At that time, it was known as white race suicide fears, and there are recognizable continuities in how people are following such belief systems right now. And here I'm going to quote Jason Stanley, a Yale philosopher uh, I admire very much. He said, if at the level of ideology that one finds the common denominator shared by American and European and especially German variants of fascism. In 1916, the American eugenicist Madison Grant published the book, The Passing of the Great Race, which decried the supposed replacement of whites in America by black people and immigrants including Polish Jews. According to Grant, these groups posed an existential threat to the Nordic race, America's native class. So this should sound familiar for us today. At what point does someone land their grievances at the door of this ideology? And at that point, we need to pay attention. <laughs> 
Given this urgency, I'm learning something crucial about the significance of research collaboration. And it's why I'm trying to make the history of eugenics a far more public, focused, oriented history. I don't think it's enough to just shrug off this legacy or to simply research it without impact. For our research to truly make an impact, to become interpreted as a much needed intervention in our society, we need to become step by step more than a series of individual presenters writing for journals or university presses whose connection may not ever be truly made with the greater society that we after all serve. Rather, I hope we can serve better uh, as interactive and evolving co-coordinators and co-collaborators as well. I'll conclude with a quote by an actor called Ricky Rowe. He's the first autistic actor to ever play an actual autistic character in a theatrical role. And for Mickey Rowe, difference brings new ways of being human. Rowe has said, can you imagine how advanced society would be right now if throughout all human history, women had been allowed to have jobs, black people hadn't been forced into menial positions, and disabled people hadn't been either killed at birth or put in institutions. I like the imagination of that quote, I like to leave it with that. I'm so grateful that you're here today at the end of the semester, and thank you so much for your attention.